everyone and welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting um, Monday, February the 1st, 2016 in Council at 9 a.m. at Council Chambers in Asuias. And welcome to you all. Uh, first month of, um, of 2016 has already flown by and tomorrow's Groundhog Day. So I'm not sure whether that is going to be good news or bad news. Um, First thing we need to do is uh, a, adoption of the agenda. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, so can I have uh, Councillor Campbell, Councillor King, all in favor? Thank you. And uh, next uh, we have two delegations this morning. And uh, our first delegation is Denise Eastlick, who's the Executive Director of the Asuias Desert Society. And uh, she comes once a year to uh, present the latest and greatest that's happening out at the Desert Center with some help from some of her executive. And, uh, and so would you um, please come up and uh, tell us what's going on this year. Thank you, Denise. Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much. I always look forward to these presentations and we so appreciate our support from the town. And this gives us an opportunity to let you know what we've been doing throughout the, the last year and what our plans are for the coming year. So that's kind of the, the gist of today's presentation. Um, give you some highlights from the past year and let you know what's coming up. So you can go ahead. So one of the, I'll dive right in, one of the big highlights from this past year was our opening day. We had an, a, a really record setting opening day. It, um, our previous record was about 71 people, and last year we had 168 on opening wow, day. Wow. And uh, one of the really great things was we partnered with the photography club, and it was a, it was a really great partnership, and that's, <laughs> that's the group of the, that showed up for the photo walk on opening day. As usual, we had uh, another really great season at the Desert Center, uh, welcomed about 7,500 people. And uh, that was really great considering that the last couple of weeks in August, we were facing what everybody was facing with the fires and the smoke. Um, so despite that, we had a really good season at the Desert Center. We also had a record setting winter program series um, and again, we are always trying to partner with people in the, and other organizations in the community. We partnered with the Asoyas Lake Water Quality Society and the Circo Rehab Facility um, on last year's program. And uh, it was a great partnership. Also, one of our big accomplishments this past year was we s installed new um, entrance signs at the Desert Center as well as we've completely replaced uh, all of the interpretive signage along the boardwalk. That did take several years, but we wrapped it up last year. And that was thanks to funding from Fortis BC and the Community Foundation. Um, we also had a lot of support from local businesses because it was a bit of an effort, as uh, Matt and Vaughn can attest to, uh, getting the signs installed. And uh, so I really want to acknowledge the support that we got from local businesses in doing that. We also sanded and restained our two large kiosks, and uh, that took a small army to be able to do that. And it was all volunteer labor. And again, tremendous support from the community and a wonderful turnout of volunteers enabled us to do that. We also expanded our entry plaza uh, in the right near the, the main entrance to the Desert Center. And that was done to give us more of a, a meeting area when we do host uh, groups and also when we host events. And again, uh, we had equipment, uh, equipment and labor donated by local businesses to help us accomplish that. Last year, we also completed our multi-year uh, vineyard study. This was phase two of a, a study that started in, back in 2009. And what it does is it was testing a seed mix that vineyards can plant between their, their rows of vineyards um, to help them control erosion, dust, invasives. <laughs> so from the vineyard's point of view, it's a, it's a uh, really good thing that offers a lot of benefits to them. From our point of view, it provides habitat for wildlife. 
and mm -hmm. increases native vegeta vegetation. So we did wrap up that uh, study this past year, and that was funded by the Real Estate Foundation of BC. We also put in a new viewing deck this past year, and that was to help visitors have a better look at our butterfly habitat area. We had done some plantings um, to encourage butterflies or provide host and nectar plants for butterflies, mm -hmm. and this gives uh, visitors to the Desert Center better, better access and better view of that area. And again, constructed entirely thanks to volunteers. So this coming year, we also have more projects in the works. Um, after building our butterfly habitat here, uh, viewing deck, we'd like to add a bluebird viewing deck this year. We, had, we also need to refinish our two small kiosks. We did the large ones last year. We are planning on doing some additional habitat restoration, particularly invasive weed control out at the desert center. We also need to finish uh, the, the garden that we put in for the, sign, or for the town and get a sign up in that garden. So I'll be needing to meet with the town on that and, and uh, the size and shape and everything that you'd like. And then uh, we also have events planned, uh, some important events planned for this year. Our winter uh, lecture series kicks off on February 20th and includes four programs again um, this year. And it's, uh, we're continuing on with the movie and speaker format, which has been extremely popular. And another huge event that uh, we've got this year is it's actually our 25th anniversary. We were formed back in 1991, and our mission is conservation re uh, restoration education. That hasn't changed. And uh, the founding members of the society formed it for two key, key reasons. One was to really enhance the community. Um, it, it obviously was formed uh, to help protect the environment, but they were very, very um, aware of the, the need to contribute to the community, and that was actually a big, big reason for forming the Desert Society and uh, starting the Desert Center. And the, the reasons why it was formed are as relevant today as they were 25 years ago. Um, we, we are living in one of Canada's most endangered habitats, one of, one of the four most endangered habitats in Canada. Uh, less than 9% remains relatively undisturbed, and that's actually a pretty old figure. Uh, that's been around probably for 10 years, so um, I'm guessing that it would be significantly less than that today. This area is home to one of the highest concentrations of at-risk species in the, in the country. Um, all of those animals pictured there are considered at risk. Everything from endangered, um, the burrowing owl and the badger, to threaten the spadefoot toad, and then the nettles cottontail is of special concern. Also home to a lot of rare species, species that are um, either have a small home range or naturally small populations. Um, two of them in this area is the pallet bat. It's one of BC's rarest mammals. And then also the desert night snake, uh, which is the rarest snake in Canada and some consider it the rarest reptile in Canada. Um, scientists didn't even know it existed until the 1980s. It mm. is that rare. And only a handful of people have actually seen it. I think it's 20-some people have seen it. One of our guides this year was lucky enough um, to be one of that small group that's actually seen a desert night snake. More rare species, and these species, it even gets more confined. Uh, the bear's hair streak, uh, which is the butterfly on the left, is only found in the South Okanagan in Canada. It's only found in the South Okanagan. And the ground mounted pictured on the right, it's only found in the extreme south of the Okanagan Valley, and uh, it has to have antelope brush habitat. Mm -hmm. So it's only found in a very, very small area. So that, that's what makes this, this area, this habitat, such a, nas a national treasure. And that's why the society, our role, um, we've been around for 25 years and, and uh, we're very much committed and dedicated to continuing that. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we are also planning for a new facility. 
our current facility um, that was put in in 1998 was, was used trailers when it was put in at the Desert Centre. Um, so we are working and planning on replacing that building. We couldn't do, Matt's going to laugh, I think he remembers that. <laughs> we couldn't obviously do what we do without the tremendous support uh, we get from the community and from our volunteers. Um, that includes a very, very hardworking board, um, two of which are here today, Vaughn and Matt, um, as well as the community uh, support we receive. The picture on the right is Romancing the Desert, and we are literally supported in that by more than 100 businesses in the area. And again, we have about 50 to 60 volunteers that support us throughout the year. <coughs> and then, um, like our volunteer and community support, we also couldn't do what we do without the tremendous support of our funding partners. We do aggressively pursue um, grants and donations for project funding. And I do have a list of all our funders for 2015, which I'll hand out at the end. The town plays a huge role in that. And one of the, the reasons the town's support is so key is because the town provides funding that can be used for core expenses. Most other grants and foundations, their funding is very much project-based. Um, it won't cover day-to-day -day operations. It'll cover specific projects, but not day-to-day -day operations. So the town, um, town support is incredibly important, and it does enable us to provide the range of services that we do to the community in terms of our programs, our events, um, serving as an information resource to the community. So the nuts and bolts, our 2016 <laughs> request is um, the town has been wonderful in providing $15,000 uh, funding as a line item for the past several years. We would appreciate if they could continue that level of support. It would, again, it would allow us to continue to offer the services that we do um, and look for new opportunities. Uh, we'd love to partner with the town on any workshops or community education uh, that the town feels uh, needs to be out there. Obviously, um, we'd like to be, uh, the town to be involved in any further planning on the, the new building down the road. Um, very much would appreciate your, your involvement and support on that as well. I do have uh, some information I can hand out, listing our board and staff, our 2015 funders, and then our financials for the last year. If you would like any additional information, please don't hesitate to get in touch. You know where I live, right next door. <laughs> and then last but certainly not least, uh, again, uh, on behalf of all of us at the Desert Society, all of the board, um, our members, our, all of all, our volunteers. We so appreciate the town's support and really value our partnership. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Denise. Um, you do a, a terrific job uh, of, of providing us with this information every year, and we're happy to support it. Um, I, I, you mentioned volunteers several times, and I, quite frankly, this town would not survive without volunteers. They are worth their weight in gold. I totally agree in just about everything that we do in this town. Volunteers are key. I just had a, a couple of things. One, are you doing anything special to celebrate your 25th? And the other one was the seed mix that you were talking about between the grapes. Do you put that together and sell it, or how does that work? Um, so we are in the process of planning a 25th anniversary okay. event. We just started talking about it at last month's board meeting. So uh, it is in the works. Probably for for April or later um, is when we'd be looking to host it. Was the exact date March the 4th? It was March the 4th. Um, and you and know how interesting that is that on March the 4th, it's the 50th anniversary of the regional district. Okay. So when I saw that, that, you know, that's the same, yeah, 25 and 50, pretty amazing. Yeah, sorry. Oh, we were just thinking that there still may be a number of uh, people gone if we tried to hold it that early. So we were thinking 
better to, to hold off a, a little bit and Absolutely. We'll later. And then in terms of the seed mix study, right now uh, we just wrapped up our, our report to the Real Estate Foundation, but now we're doing the scientific report, um, which is more crunching the numbers and the, the monitoring data because that's the seed mix was monitored for four years. And so we're combine, compiling that. We will put the scientific report on our website. And then um, I think we do need to talk about next steps, how we can, um, I think, first of all, get the information out there so that vineyards are aware of the results of it. And then, yeah, consider things like potentially providing a seed mix or at least letting vineyards know where to go Good. for that seed mix. Thank you. Councillor King. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I had the opportunity with a group to uh, tour your facility last year and very impressed with the new signage and especially the picnic tables. When you're bringing a group, they have a, a place to sit down. Really want to thank all the volunteers because it just seems every year it gets bigger and better. And, and with that, I'd really like to encourage the public to take their family up and, and tour your facility and wish you the best. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Thank you. Did you? No, I mean, just uh, knowing how much work goes into acquiring the funds to do this and keep that volunteer base going uh, says a lot about uh, your board, so well done. We do. We have a tremendous board. And the fact that you're that you're partnering with other um, with other groups is is really makes it kind of fun and expands everybody's uh, ability to help. So I think that's that's really good. Did anybody else have anything to? No. Okay, um, and you do see, Denise, that later on we have bee-friendly plants that we're going to be talking about. I wasn't sure whether you would be, uh, you were staying for that part of it or whether we could just get them to contact you if one that comes up on our agenda. Oh, whichever, I'm happy to stay or oh, it, whatever yeah. works. And we did, a, a few years ago, we put in a, a small bee garden up at the Desert Centre in our native plant demonstration garden. Um, so we have done research on bee-friendly plants and all that and would be happy to provide any assistance. Good. That's exactly what we need. Thank you very much. And thank you for, um, for bringing uh, some of your board with you and uh, always coming to, to council to fill us in on, the, on what's going on. So thank you very much. Okay. And I do have the list of funders and our last newsletter. Should I just leave it with Sure. Brianne? Is that okay, Brianne? Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So that presentation will, will be received for information. Okay, the next, uh, the next uh, delegation is a proposed travel rebate incentive program for American tourists. And this is Cam Bissonette, who is the general manager of the Suisse Duty Free Shop. So thank you, Cam, for coming. Thank you for having me. Morning, Mayor, Council. Um, I'm here seeking support from the town of Osias uh, for the, as you said, the road trip. The Just your mic, Cam. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. The uh, uh, road trip, uh, trip being an acronym for the Travel uh, Rebate Incentive Program. Uh, what we're trying to do is incent uh, American travelers to come up to Osias, uh, well, basically the Okanagan, bigger picture Canada, um, to um, visit our country and uh, spend some money uh, while they're here. Um, this is a program um, that was run in uh, the duty-free industry in the uh, mid-90s and early 2000s. It was counseled rather by the previous uh, federal government. Um, still, We still get people to this day coming into the stores looking for uh, the tax rebate. Um, it uh, is a good marketing tool um, that was very successful in the past. Uh, counseled, counseled for a few reasons which were legitimate. Uh, we're trying to present a a uh, better, more comprehensive uh, program right now. Very successful uh, lobbying um, um, program uh, right now uh, in Ottawa. Um, I don't know how much you want me to go into this. Uh, I think you've seen the material that I've provided. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I should go through it all. Or And, and we have that. And I'm, what I'm thinking is, uh, yes, I've had a look at it as well. And I'm just wondering if maybe um, we could just get some questions from you and we could could refer to it sure um, the because you've sent us quite a lot of information mm -hmm. and we certainly appreciate that I was just reading today in the province that um, 
that the increase of visitors to British Columbia, likely because of the dollar, is is phenomenal. And I see that the Americans are, it's a 12% increase, but from France, it's a 26%, I think, increase. So I immediately thought, and when I looked at this, it has it has to be a road trip, doesn't it? So you, this is not, you're not able to offer this um, this program if it came back in to anybody other than Americans. Am I correct in that? Well, yes and no. We wouldn't be able to offer it anywhere other than points of exit, uh, other than uh, land borders. Uh, the previous program um, offered it at airports, but the problem was that somebody would come to an airport, they, you know, flying's kind of stressful, yeah. you don't have a lot of time, they had kiosks set up, it was tough to verify that the goods were actually leaving the country. Uh, and the problem with this is that the people would take their money and fly back to France or, yes. you know, whatever continent they were from, and the money immediately left. The difference with this program is that people are, are um, the, the duty-free shop program is one of the most compliant uh, programs that the federal government works with. Um, so our staff has been trained to inspect the goods, check the people's ID, uh, make sure that the products are going to be leaving the country, they can give their money back. And we found in the past when we ran the program before, um, upwards of 60% of the money was actually left in Canada, in the stores. Um, so a much different scenario than, you know, taking that money back to your country. So I remember my husband buying years and years ago, probably 30 years ago, buying some uh, a set of speakers and he managed to get them, I think, in Spokane. So when he... When he brought them through, he did the opposite at the at the American side, and I believe, and was able to get that the the um, the tax back. But when he brought them into the state into Canada, anyway, it took some time. He didn't get the money right then. I think he had to apply for it, and the money was then reimbursed. That isn't the case. This in this, it, you would get give the money up front. Or right we would, away. We'd yeah. give the money back on the spot. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about that is that um, Canada is the only OECD nation that doesn't have a program like this right mm -hmm. now. Now people would say, well, why doesn't the U.S. do it? But the U.S. does not have a national sales tax. It's a state-by-state okay. state tax, right? Okay. And some, like in this situation, maybe it was a state tax that your husband Could have been. been. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, so we would give the money back on the spot. Of course, when people are on vacation and they're going home and they get a little free cash, they're like, oh, maybe I should buy some maple syrup. Maybe I should buy some BC wine. Perfect. Maybe I should buy a you know, hand carved totem pole, whatever the situation may be. Yeah. So that yeah, totally makes sense for sure. Yeah. So does anybody have any other um, questions about this? Yeah, I, you, I yeah. guess my question, Cam, are you looking for support from the town to incorporate this new program or what do you, or we just information? So. What it is is that we've provided a, a sample form letter yeah. um, mm -hmm. that uh, we would hope that the town would adopt and put their letterhead on it and sign it and that type of thing. Um, just supporting our lobbying initiative. I have a um, email I just got here the other day with a list of what have I done with that? A list of some of the other communities that have uh, supported it: Mayor of Sarnia, Windsor, uh, Toronto, Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, Sault Ste. Marie. Um, TIAC has supported it. The National Chamber of Commerce has supported it. Retail Council of Canada, CFIB. So you know, a lot of. Um, communities and national organizations see the benefit in it. So that's all we're looking for. It's just a letter of support that we will uh, put into our um, package that we will um, uh, present to the Minister of Finance. Okay. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, so we've certainly, uh, we certainly like to do anything to encourage um, visitors into into our country and it certainly looks like a good deal right now with the with the with the dollar difference so I'm sure that there are a lot of Americans that are coming up here um, Mr. Romanko could you tell us what would be the next step here I think the next step would just be to uh, uh, move this to the uh, uh, this afternoon's agenda okay and uh, then uh, if uh, council can debate uh, the uh, you know the support uh, for the uh, for the request, and then a motion would be supportive of uh, in one way or the other for the for the decision, and and uh, for us to perhaps write a letter or use this one, we would talk about that as well. That's right. Yeah. You, it, basically, the resolution would be to uh, either to support uh, providing a letter or or non-support depending okay. on how the d debate went. Uh, I would suggest 
shorter letter. Uh, uh, my experience with uh, the federal government, the provincial government, is uh, nothing o nothing over a page ever works. Sure. Uh, and and you, I would suggest okay that for. That oh, we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing I did fail to mention, though, is that um, this isn't strictly about my business. Of course, uh, if this uh, program is adopted uh, on a national level, what we would be doing is we'd be putting together a. Um, marketing advertising campaign we'd be going out to retailers within the communities letting them know about it so they can actually use it as a sales tool within their stores sure so when americans come in they say well do you realize that you're going to get yeah. your five percent back and so on and so forth is there i mean you're not going to do this on on small amounts is there a minimum amount is that been there's the case? no minimum amount oh. right now um that was one of the problems with the um previous uh program is that there were thresholds that had to mm -hmm. be met of course, when people are traveling, um, some of the, uh, you know, the, at the time we give it back on hotel accommodations as well, um, mm. but sometimes the people, the hoteliers or the uh, retailers didn't do a great job on explaining how people would come into our stores expecting, you know, to get, you know, to have a stack of receipts like this and get it all back and yeah. that uh, created some challenges. People yes. would get upset when they didn't get what they thought they were supposed sure. to be receiving. So we're keeping it as simple as possible, streamlined. As long as you can prove that you have the goods in your possession, you're exporting them out of the country, and you can um, provide a receipt for it, um, we will give you the money back. Um, I, I believe there is a maximum threshold, though. Okay. So somebody couldn't come in and expect to get um, yes. you know, thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars or anything like that. Good. Well, that makes sense. Thank you. Anybody else? We so could we have a, a motion to move yeah. it to this so afternoon? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, King Campbell, all in favor? Thank you. And thank you very much for bringing this to our thank attention. You. Yeah, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, next on our on our agenda is the uh, the letter from um, Home Hardware, and uh, let me get that. It was um, sent from Carla Jorgens, who is uh, used to be Carla Solajuk. And um, she just wondered if we had any plans to feature more bee-friendly plants in parks and public areas this year. If Asuius is interested in taking a step towards saving our honeybees, please let us know as we would like to help. We have a very eager bee expert here who now has over six hives and is happy to volunteer her time and expertise. Please let us know if this is of interest to you and if you'd like to discuss the topic further. Thank you in advance for your time. So I did go in and see Carla and said that this would be coming up to to council. So um, how would we, how could we, oh, Mr. Dinwoody. <laughs> uh, well, we have some uh, landscaping projects that we have in mind for this coming year, and it's, uh, I will certainly be interested in talking with the home hardware people and seeing if we can incorporate some bee-friendly plants in these. Projects. We also have those um, self-watering planters along Main Street. I'm hoping to purchase two more of those for this year, and so maybe that's another place where we could put some bee-friendly plants and hopefully help out the bees. And it seems to me that a couple of years ago, the high school had a group, and they um, sold sunflowers. Is that correct? And th and that was and that was those were bee friendly. So um, they sold them in. I know I put some in my garden. I bought some, and they did put them in various places. So I think that's one okay. plant that is bee friendly. Am I correct, I Miss uh, Denise? Would you know that? I know that's what they they sold, and I think there yeah, there's native native varieties, and that's what we tried to do with the desert center was all native. So I think it's a great idea, and anything that we can do to help help the bees, um, how can we proceed here? Do we ask Mr. Dinwoody to go down and talk to Home Hardware? Yeah, I think that's the, the strategy here, and I think part of it was that uh, uh, the sunflowers uh, are, are kind of difficult in public areas. Mm -hmm. uh, they're it's kind okay. of an attractant to more than just bees. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, part of it is that uh, we... Uh, uh, the director of operations would work with our people who uh, provide our, our uh, you know, planters uh, and ensure that uh, we move towards using uh, plants or, or focus on, on using plants that are bee friendly. Uh, potentially we could also have some signage or something. 
that uh, acknowledges it, and maybe in certain areas. And uh, but I think the first uh, uh, a couple first steps would be to acknowledge what uh, uh, Carla wants to do at Home Hardware, yes. and then take a look at the varieties that would in fact. Uh, work within our planters within town because we do have a number of planters that are probably bee friendly right now because um, uh, there's right. lots of blossoms there and, there could be you know yeah. so uh, we just take a look at you know what what we, we try to uh, use uh, uh, local you know desert mm -hmm. type of mm -hmm. floor uh, as much as possible so I think that's a wonderful idea, and Denise from the Desert Center is definitely uh, has some good ideas on that as well. Sure. So uh, I think that you know that everybody could work together on this. Um, so would we do a um, uh, a motion to ask Mr. Dinwoody to? No, I think it's oh. it's in his it's in his directives already. Perfect. To, to, uh, to Thank act you very in that much. <laughs> So we're all we're all set. This will yeah. move uh, forward. Yeah, we'll take care. It's a little early yet, but we'll. Start. <laughs> well, it I don't is, know. They tell me I'm groping it, at the end of the month. So. Yeah. It is Groundhog Day tomorrow. It is. So, yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, and thank you, Denise, no for your help in this as we move forward. Um. So the next is a report from Mr. Dinwoody on proposed updates to the existing snow and ice control policy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the existing snow and ice control policy PW010 uh, fails to prioritize the plowing of the airport or identify timelines with regards to the removal of snow piles in the downtown area. The following proposed updates will address these deficiencies in the existing policy. <coughs> Under the scope uh, of snow and ice control services of the existing policy, uh, the following modifications are proposed. <laughs> Uh, add the following text to point number one under scope of snow and ice control services. It is proposed that the plowing of snow from the airport <coughs> runway occur after the clearing of town parking lots in the list of priority snow removal locations. Therefore, the list of snow removal priority locations would be as follows. Emergency vehicle access and egress routes. Number two is snow during, uh, sorry, schools during school days. Number three, the downtown area. Number four, inclines. Number five, town parking lots. Number six, the airport. And number seven, churches. After the end of a snowfall event, the Director of Operational Services will contact NAV Canada and provide them with a runway service condition report. Prior to snow removal operations commencing at the airport, the Director of Operational Services will once again contact NAV Canada and request that they issue something called a Notice to Airmen or a NOTAM informing them the time period during which snow removal operations will be occurring. So what you do is you call them and you tell them for the next two hours you cannot land at the airport, we're plowing the snow. And then people know to stay away for those two hours, and then after that they're free to come and land if they wish. Add the following new point number six under scope of snow and ice control services. Uh, snow clearing and removal from the downtown parking areas. After all other snow clearing operations have been completed, then town forces will be deployed to remove snow from the on-street parking spaces in the downtown area. Snow will be plowed into several empty parking spaces, preferably in front of vacant businesses or lots, uh, where it will be removed within 72 hours after placement. This activity will occur at the discretion of the Director of Operational Services or his designate who will consider ease of travel, resource availability, and the safety of pedestrian and vehicular traffic in the downtown area before undertaking this activity. The remaining snow clearing activities in existing policy PW010 will be appropriately renumbered and Schedule A modified to include snow removal at the airport. Also, since the equipment utilized by the town to clear snow and ice is continuously evolving, it is suggested that it not be specified specifically listed in policy P010. The options for council, uh, the council <coughs> approves suggested updates to the snow and ice control policy. That council does not approve recommended updates to the snow and ice and control policy or option number three, the council requests <coughs> additional information prior to making a decision. Uh, the recommendation of the administration is that council adopt option number one, the approval of the updates to the snow and ice control policy. Um, thank you very much. Um, I had a couple questions about this. Sure. I was wondering, um, I was surprised actually when I realized that the airport might be considered in this mainly because I don't think that we get um, planes landing during snowstorms or in the winter time. It's not I typical, think it's but we did have a, uh, actually a phone call this, this winter uh, where oh. we had not actually plowed the airport. It had been after the event, snow event, quite some time. But somebody was willing to come here and, oh, note, okay. and they actually phoned to see if the runway was open. 
Uh, at that time, the runway was not been plowed, and so we actually had to send somebody out to plow the runway because it wasn't on our list of priorities to do. So. Absolutely. Well, then that makes perfect sense. Okay. Can I ask why it's been put ahead of churches? I just sure. thought there would be a lot of um, people using the parking lots at well, churches. Well, we said in front of churches unless it's a Sunday. Uh, <laughs> and it, like, we have a different plowing schedule for weekdays and for Saturdays and Sundays. On Sundays, churches would be ahead of the airport. It, it, yeah. And, and typically, we, we would be plowing the airport. Uh, if it there was a snow event, we probably we're not. We typically don't plow on the weekends, anyways. So it was, you know, it's a weekday sort of thing. So because we're plowing during the week, we would. That's why it was put above churches because we assume that the churches are busier on the weekend, and by the weekend we would have it all done. It only okay. takes about three quarters of an hour to plow the airport. Okay. Uh, we're we're allowing for two just to make sure that we're safe sure. with the no temp. That we don't plow uh, church parking lots. They, it's just in front of the church, the the, the roadways. So it's their responsibility. That's right. yeah, plow it's their parking. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Their parking lots. Um, council, oh. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can you just give me a little instance on number four inclines? Like, who makes the decision which incline is more important than the other? Um, I assume by inclines that they would in all the hills in town. I don't. We haven't actually prioritized which hill is more important than the other hills. Yeah. We, we just assume that they're all kind of the same and that we try to hit them as quickly as we can. I, I think we, if I could just speak to that, yeah. uh, probably the most frequent travel park, uh, travel ways, for example, the incline to the high school well, would be, yeah, would, would be, would be considered and, and also to Dividend Ridge, uh, given given the amount of traffic that uh, goes uh, and the, the sure. amount of inclines. Uh, again, it's uh, like anything else, it's arterial roads first, mm -hmm. uh, and then, then we take a look at uh, residential areas. Yeah, I just didn't want to get in conflict of interest that you're plowing your neighbors or your <laughs> staffs first. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I live on a flat section right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Campbell. I would motion that Council approves the suggested updates to snow and ice control policy PW010. Can we, we don't, how do we Actually, I, 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 the appropriate uh, handling of this would be to move it to the agenda for, for a formal yeah, resolution, sure. given it's a policy direction. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, again, the, the policy would have to uh, stand up in the event of uh, some type of liabilities. So best to have it uh, done at a regular council meeting as a policy update, uh, unlike the report reads. So would you make that motion sure. then? Sure. Oh, Thank you. Sure. Yeah. All in favor then that we move it to move it to this afternoon's meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I believe that's all that we have today. Am I correct? Sorry. Yeah. Just to, just to add to this, uh, over the years, one of the, the the issues we always had, and we hope to address with this particular policy, was you know people. You know, there was no specific uh, framework as to when the piles would remo be removed off Main Street. This gives us 72 hours uh, as a, as a as a guideline, and and then we can say 72 hours. And again, then we have to take a look at what what are all the Im other implications. But uh, so for council that that gets phone calls. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if uh, you can either direct them to the administration and we'll say 72 hours or if, if, if you remember, so, yeah. you say we can have, we have a policy about that. Thank you. Because I, that, I'm glad you brought that up because I thought 72 hours as well. And I thought, you know, if you were busy and there was lots of them and it snowed again or something, you may yeah, not get to that. No, we're kind of assuming that the 70, like when we say 72 hours, that's after we've placed the pile. So we, yes. we're, we're assuming it quit snowing. <laughs> we haven't added to the piles, you know, since you, that. You so. found that out since moving here, have you? <laughs> <laughs> they told me it would never snow, but it does snow. Really <laughs> so. And I think, you know, in the, in the the seven years I've been here, I think we've only had to pile snow. This was the second time or third yeah, time. Yeah, a couple of times. So it's yeah. not it's not an annual event. Hopefully. No, no, it doesn't happen a lot. But like I said, at least it provides us some terms of reference to move the piles when it's time. Is there what? Okay, so thank you very much. We will move that to this afternoon then. And could I have a motion to Some adjourn more. Campbell King or King Campbell, whichever you like? All in favor. Thank you very much. We'll take five minutes.